Hi, and welcome to the Fourth Universalist Service video. My name is Amber Kelly. I'm the Director of Religious Education here at the Fourth Universalist Society. Thank you so much for joining us. What follows is video and audio from our service on April 25th, 2021, featuring guest minister, Reverend Paula Nance, who joins us to think about wisdom. In this video, you'll get to hear the reading as well as the reflection. And following that, Reverend Paula and I sit down for a discussion diving deeper into some of the themes of the service. You're invited to check out this video and audio podcast each week. It's posted on our website, on our Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and your favorite podcast streaming sites. If you like what you see, we hope that you give us a positive review. The likes, the comments, the sharing, and subscribing, it helps spread forth Universalist media further. Thank you again for watching, and we turn now to our reading. A reading from the seventh chapter of the Wisdom of Solomon, starting at the 22nd verse. For wisdom, the fashioner of all things taught me. There is in her a spirit that is intelligent, holy, unique, manifold, subtle, mobile, clear, unpolluted, distinct and vulnerable, loving the good, keen, irresistible, beneficent, humane, steadfast, sure, free from anxiety, all-powerful, overseeing all, and penetrating through all spirits that are intelligent, pure, and altogether subtle. For wisdom is more mobile than any emotion. Because of her pureness, she pervades and penetrates all things, for she is a breath of the power of God and a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, nothing defiled gains entrance into her, for she is a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God, and an image of God's goodness. Although she is but one, she can do all things, and while remaining in herself, she renews all things. In every generation, she passes into holy souls and make the, makes them friends of God and prophets. For God loves nothing so much as the person who lives with wisdom. She is more beautiful than the sun and excels every constellation of the stars. Compared with the light, she is found to be superior, for it is succeeded by the night. But against wisdom, evil does not prevail. Here ends our reading. When Nancy asked me a couple of months ago if I would be able to preach in April, I was very happy to say yes. I started wondering, however, whatever would we talk about today? My personal experience of the last 13 months of pandemic has been focused on the present. My days have been filled with the daily tasks of learning to teach remotely, providing help and health care for the folks I love, trying with varying degrees of success or not to stay in touch with other folks I know who are isolated all around the world, and learning how to navigate Simple tasks like going to the grocery store in a state where mask wearing has not always been enforced. When people ask me about my future plans, including when I'll be coming back to the city, my response has frequently been that at the moment, I can only see to the end of my nose and sometimes not even that far. Then a few things happened almost simultaneously. One of my very favorite professors from Duke Divinity School, Dr. James Mickey Eford passed away. You might remember hearing me refer to Dr. Eford in previous sermons. He was a biblical scholar whose beautiful Southern accent made it seem like I was learning Greek in the fictional town of Mayberry RFD. As I contemplated Dr. Eford's influence on my education and vocation as a minister, I went online and purchased a couple of his books, books that I might very well already have from classes years ago 
but they're packed in a box away in somebody's attic. Around the same time, my church across town, Metro Baptist Church, had an incredibly moving service dedicated to the theme of wisdom. I remembered that one of my newly purchased books by Dr. Eford was Biblical Books of Wisdom and ideas for this sermon started percolating. The book explores the wisdom movements of ancient cultures, especially in the early Jewish thought of the Israelite community. The literature of most ancient wisdom movements can be divided into two categories. The first is a practical or pragmatic wisdom that attempted to explain the meaning of life and the way of the world often in the form of short pithy sayings or proverbs. The idea was that if you could figure out the patterns and follow the rules for how the world works, then you would live a good and prosperous life. The second category, speculative or contemplative wisdom literature, developed as people realized that life is sometimes unfair regardless of how many rules you follow. Sometimes good people suffer, evil people prosper, pandemics happen. Wisdom movements came about because people wanted to make sense of life. They wanted to know how to cope with the world around them. The second chapter of the book is called Coping when things are normal. I'll be honest with you. I almost skipped that one entirely. Are you kidding? It's been so long since I've seen normal that I don't know that I would recognize it if it fell on top of me. The book describes a normal life setting as a situation in which all things are equal. I don't know if I've ever known that kind of life setting. The next three chapters are coping when tragedy strikes, coping when life makes no sense, and coping in critical situations. Ding, ding, ding. Now these sound more familiar. Some of you might remember that two and a half years ago, I preached a sermon at Fourth U from the book of Ecclesiastes the subject of the chapter, Coping When Life Makes No Sense, in Dr. Eford's book. The writer was a skeptical curmudgeon referred to by scholars as Kaheleth, which means the teacher or preacher, as the case may be. Kaheleth is incredibly frustrated and annoyed that he cannot make sense of the world and its inequities. He is angry that he cannot fully understand and personally experience God. He bemoans the limitations of pursuing knowledge, which is especially unfortunate since he's devoted his entire life to studying and teaching. Dr. Eford reminds us that regardless of his often quoted observation that all is vanity, Kaheleth challenges us to keep on going in this world, doing one's duty in spite of the uncertainties and ambiguities of life, with the hope that God, somehow, somewhere, will make things balance. Hope is a theme that keeps popping up as I research wisdom. Alexandre Dumont wrote that, all human wisdom is contained in these two words, wait and hope. These days, as far as waiting is concerned, I really have no choice. Hope, on the other hand, hope has been harder. Hope I have to actively work at. I have found it difficult to be hopeful in the last several years. That doesn't mean that I haven't experienced hope. It just means that it hasn't been easy. I'm overwhelmed by political corruption here and elsewhere at the sheer greed that perpetuates global inequities, 
by systemic misogyny and racism and violence towards anyone who doesn't look or love the way we do. I'm staggered by the warnings of global warming and animal extinction. In 1988, Isaac Asimov said, the saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. I don't think that's changed one little bit. Wisdom in this scenario is knowing how to justly and morally use the knowledge that we are gaining. We've learned a lot in the last 13 months. We're still learning a lot every day. How are we going to use that knowledge for the betterment of all people, for the betterment of all creation? Lisa Lutz, the author of the Spellman's series wrote, our ability to adapt is amazing. Our ability to change isn't quite as spectacular. How quickly we adapted to the worldwide crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic. While we were still trying to process the daily numbers of cases and deaths, masks became the fashion a la mode. Many people embraced working from home and almost all my students preferred remote learning. Social media was filled with photos of food and handmade crafts and homemade videos as folks attempted to navigate their new normal. We've adapted, but will we change? Have we learned anything about our global interconnectedness? Are we learning how to share information and resources so that all people have enough food and medicine and clean water. Some scientists say that we have the resources to feed and care for every person on this planet. But do we have the wisdom to actually carry that out? The Kid President video that Ember showed us earlier in the service would tell us that this kind of wisdom looks like love. Cornell, Cornell West reminds us to never forget that justice is what love looks like in public. For too many years, we have been told that it is smart to take care of our own interests. It is smart to save our resources for ourselves alone. It is smart to take all we can whenever we can and hold on to it as tightly as we can. It is good business. It is in our national interest. It is smart to protect who we are and what is ours, regardless of how this affects anyone else. It may be smart and I am not convinced it is but it is not wise. It is not just, it is not love. One of the lectionary texts for today at Metro asks the question, how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a sister or brother in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us not love. Let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. Let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. That's wisdom. That's how wisdom moves among and through us. That is what wisdom teaches us. When I mentioned to Mark the theme of today's service, he told me that he had just read an opinion column in the New York Times by David Brooks, wisdom isn't what you think it is. 
Brooks says that wise people don't tell us what to do. They start by witnessing our story. They help us understand where we are now so we can change our relationship to our past and future. Where we are now is not a normal life setting. All things are not equal and we desperately need to change our relationship to the past and our future. Corporately, collectively, how are we going to discover and develop the wisdom to do this? Well, as Kid President would say, it starts with one person and that person is you. Where do you find wisdom? What wise teacher is listening to and witnessing your story? Whose stories are you listening to? For whom are you wise? With what faith partners, official or serendipitous, are we experiencing a wisdom movement so that we can love not in word or speech? but in truth and action so that our doors will be opened and our tables crowded. Let it be. As I edit and produce this video, I want to extend a special note of thanks to Reverend Paula Nance. We ran into technical issues where Zoom decided that it did not want to keep recording when it was supposed to be recording. Reverend Paula was gracious enough to sit down and share with me again the reflection from the service. Reverend Paula, we are grateful for you being amongst us. So Reverend Paula, I'm really excited to get to sit down with you today, even amidst all of our technological issues that we seem to have encountered in today's uh, service. And as we were preparing for this discussion video, you were, you were uh, sharing some of your own recent technology woes as well. Yes, um, yesterday, so I, the way that I prepare sermon is that I percolate for weeks and I do some research and I um, decide what I'm gonna um, listen to and, um, and I take lots of notes. And then I recently, thanks to technology, um, I will speak my notes into my phone or my device and then I will um, transfer those to a, a Word doc and I'll fix it, finesse it, tighten it up. Um, and then I have a sermon. And um, yesterday I did that. I sat down, I had some quiet space. It was really good. I spoke for about two and a half hours. I spoke into my phone, was really excited about some of the things that um, had come together, saved it to a draft ran off for three minutes, came back and it was gone. It hadn't saved. <laughs> so the rest of the day was me trying to um, reconnect with the thoughts I'd had and uh, being somewhat convinced that um, they were not nearly as wise as the one that I'd had a couple of hours before. <laughs> Although I, I texted a few friends and one of them said, well, you're obviously three hours older now, so you must be wiser. Yes, yes. You know, I, I imagine there was extra pressure in, a, in writing a sermon about wisdom when it suddenly disappears as it, it's coming together. You feel no. that, that lost wisdom. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not, I don't know about wise, but it didn't feel very smart. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> well, you know, wisdom is fleeting. It seems very book of Ecclesiastes to be having, uh, having some, some technology struggles. Everything is vain under the sun, especially Zoom and <laughs> recording. Um, so I really, you know, appreciated the way that you connected wisdom to thinking about how we change the world for the better. And I really liked the, the Time for All Ages video um, that you uh, helped send my way to pass on as an idea. And, you know, it wisdom is part of, of the uh, the way we change the world. I, you know, you mention, uh, and it's mentioned in the video that, um, especially in the video, that there is 
people who think that they're really smart and that's going to solve all the world's problems that, you know, there's lots of academics, especially that they have their laundry list of here's what we got to do to fix all the problems. But what it really takes is, is wisdom to actually bring about that change. Do you think that, what do you, what do you think is kind of the relationship between knowing things and being wise? I've, I've always thought that wisdom is knowing how to apply knowledge. And I think there are lots of definitions for wisdom, uh, but one of my, one of my favorite ways of understanding wisdom as it is related to knowledge is um, that wisdom helps us know how to use knowledge um, I, I very much identify with the Asimov quote that um, one of the deepest sadnesses of our time is that science is gathering knowledge faster than society can gather wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I do think that. I think we know how to do many, many things, um, but we do not. I, I think technology is definitely one of those examples. Right? We can do all kinds of things um, uh, with technology and with the internet, for example, um, that are not wise to do uh, or that need to have much more discussion and thought and reflection uh, before we know how to do them. Um, no, I think that that makes sense. And especially um, that that makes me think about this last year um, that we uh, suddenly had to learn a whole new set of wisdom of COVID wisdom of what was, um, you know, there was, there was lots of information out there, lots of knowledge out there, but we had to become COVID wise in uh, how we wanted to live our lives. What what were our rules and parameters? What were we doing? Were we, you know, completely locked down? Were we um, wearing masks? There was so much going on. And, you know, as you were saying, we, as a society have been moving so fast and gosh, especially there at the beginning of, of COVID, did that feel like moving fast? Um, and, but I think that a year, you know, a year and a year and some months now, um, it, it feels like we've, we've gained some, some wisdom about a few different things in, in the time since then. What do, you, what do you think are some wisdoms that you have learned in this last, uh, some bits of wisdom that you've learned in this last year of COVID life? Um, my COVID life has been particularly dictated by uh, where I am with my mom and her husband and um, by my mom's health issues. And so I think, a, I think perhaps some of the lessons that as a whole people have learned um, have, for me, they've come through a different kind of lens. Uh, if I had been in New York and isolated completely on my own, um, I might have learned more introspection, <laughs> reflection. Um, the, the most, the thing that I've had to repeat to myself over and over again, so it must be what I need to learn, um, is that I need to be gentle with myself and I need to be gentle with the people around me. So every day my prayer is to be gentle and kind and patient and present, not to worry too much, which is hard. Um, all of that's hard to be quite honest. I'm, I, I'm, I don't know that I'm a gentle person by nature. I think I can be quite um, confrontational and um, argumentative. And I actually think that that's the way that I protect the people I love. And it has been the way that I have m made a voice for myself in the world and the way that I vocalize how I feel 
about injustice. Um, so I, I'm not, I, I don't feel shame about being argumentative <laughs> and confrontational, <laughs> but it hasn't necessarily been the best way to live the last 13 months. Um, so being gentle, being kind, being patient, being present. I think that is some deep wisdom for us to all take from today. Reverend Paula, thanks so much for sitting down with me for this discussion time. Thank you very much, Ember. I always enjoy uh, interacting with and, and um, thinking with uh, the folks at 4th U. So thank yes, you so much. We, we always love to have you. Thank and you. thanks so much to all of our listeners as well. Mm -hmm.